The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. I'm Lynn Prong with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and we'd like to welcome you to today's webinar hosted by the U.S. Department of Energy Solar Decathlon. Before we begin, I'll quickly go over some of the webinar features. For audio, you have a couple options. You can either listen through your computer or telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. By doing so, we'll eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. If you select the telephone option, you should already see a box on the right side that displays the telephone number. Panelists, we ask that you please mute your audio device while you are not presenting. If you're having difficulties with the webinar, you can contact the GoToWebinar help desk for assistance. Throughout the webinar today, um, you're welcome to ask a question. Please use the questions pane to type in your question. Um, if you are having difficulties, we are recording the webinar today, and the recording will be available on the Groups I.O. site. And now for today's presentation. Our webinar today is Solar Decathlon 2019 Design Challenge with Solar Edge. Our speakers today are Rachel Romero, Project Leader and Energy Engineer at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. She's also the Design Challenge Manager. We also have two speakers from Solar Edge, one of our two host sponsors of Solar Decathlon Design Challenge. With that, I'd like to welcome Rachel to start today's presentation. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, so we will have on the agenda today a quick introduction to our speakers. Uh, Solar Edge will be talking about some of their technologies, and then we will conclude and answer some questions. So with that, I, I will introduce our first speaker. Cameron Stewart is currently the West Coast Applications Engineer at Solar Edge, specializing with storage and backup products. Previously, he was the training manager for North America at Solar Edge and focused on content creation as well as conducting trainings across the U.S. Stewart has 15 years of industry experience. Over seven years within the... Hey, Rachel. Yes. Hey, Rachel. Yes. I'm sorry, but your audio is going in and out. Oh. Can you hear me? Over... I'm, I'm sorry, your audio is going in and out? Yes. Okay. Uh, Stuart has yes. ever. Yeah, I'm sorry. That that better? Yes, it is, and I'm sorry. Uh, you might want to introduce Cameron again. Okay, I apologize. Cameron Stewart is currently the West Coast Applications Engineer at Solar Edge, special specializing with storage and backup products. Previously, he was a training manager for North America at Solar Edge and focused on the content creation as well as conducting trainings across the U.S. Stewart has 15 years of industry experience. Over seven years within the same company, he moved from installation through project management, system design, and operations management, while also earning his degree in chemistry from Arizona State University. Craving more knowledge and experience, he became an Operations and Management Manager for a module manufacturer in Tucson, Arizona. Two years of troubleshooting inverters brought him to a role with an inverter, mac inverter manufacturer as technical support and trainer in Phoenix, Arizona. Stewart then made his way to Solar Edge, where he has been excited to work for the last four years. Our second speaker is Gal Roeder, who is currently a product manager at Solar Edge Technologies specializing in the development and marketing of software for PV design, energy simulation, and ROI analysis. As part of his role, GAL is a focal point for both internal and external training of new PV software launched by the company. Before joining SolarEdge, GAL previously acted as both a software developer and a project manager at SAP. In, the, in this position, he was responsible for critical aspects the company's cloud development platform and tools. Gal holds a BA in computer science from the Interdisciplinary Center. So I'll turn it over to Cameron. How's it going guys? I'm super excited to be here. Thank you, Rachel and Lynn. Just wanna make sure that everyone can see my screen. Great, you're looking great. Fantastic. <clears throat> All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So again, my name is Cameron Stewart. 
Uh, I'm going to go through a presentation that we call Powering the Future with Solar Edge. And basically, I'm just going to run you through what Solar Edge technologies are, what we do, how we do them uh, to help guide you through your design. Uh, again, with me, I have Gal Roeder. He's our product manager for our web based designer, and he's going to run through a live demonstration on how to use the designer. But first, let's get to know who Solar Edge is. So we are a global leader in high performance smart energy technology. Uh, we are a smart energy manager and basically our mission is to achieve engineering excellence and relentless innovation. We drive progress through creating smart energy solutions that power the future. A little bit about our numbers. So we have shipped over 9.6 gigawatts of solar systems worldwide. Of those 9.6 gigawatts, we are monitoring, actively monitoring and collecting data of over 750,000 systems around the world. Uh, we make an optimized inverter. So our power optimizer, we are at 30.9 million power optimizers. But the number that I really like the most is the one down here on the bottom right hand corner. It's 140 awarded patents with a, an additional 194 patent applications. So we are a company of engineers. We are always striving to innovate and be the best. And we do that through, again, engineering excellence. So we've got to the position that we're in right now. So we are number one worldwide of inverter supplier. So we're number one ranked Solar Edge. And then for our single phase specifically inverter, we're also number one. So we supply the world a lot of, a lot of inverters and we're developing other technologies and other great things that really uh, create a concept of, of smart energy management and how we want to basically reinvent how people look at their energy and how they're using their energy. And uh, so we're going to do that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how we got to number one. Uh, first, we made an optimized inverter. And basically, we have a device that's our power optimizer that sits on the roof and does module level MPPT. So what that means is we extract the most energy available from every single solar panel that's on the roof. Because of our architecture and our design, we were able to have longer strings and more flexibility in our string length. So traditionally, if you're using a string inverter, you're basically making a DC circuit of a whole bunch of solar panels wired in series. And the code and other things restrict us to 600 volts DC. So that means you're only allowed to run like 10 to 12 solar panels in a, in a DC circuit. Um, with Solar Edge, because of, again, we're changing the DC voltage and we have this interesting architecture, uh, we can get 20 solar panels on a single string or a single circuit. So it gives our installers and our designers a lot of flexibility if they want to get that extra solar panel on the roof, if they have basically a short string or a long string saves money. So there's a lot of reasons that this is advantageous and we'll go through them all a little bit later. And then safety. So when you think about it, the sun is always up when we're installing. Hopefully we're not installing solar panels in the dark because who wants to work in the dark, but uh, you can't turn off the solar panel. When you add the solar, the power optimizer, uh, we basically have a one volt DC voltage and we call that safety C. So inherently the system is safer to install because we're mitigating the risk of voltage incurred. All right, so this is what the kind of optimized solution looks like. We have our power optimizers. These are not installed underneath every single solar panel. We work with commercial or three phase buildings as well as single phase or residential homes. We have different inverters for that. Our power optimizer is basically a, uh, again, a module power, module level power electronic, and it's warranted for 25 years. Uh, so it's, it's almost bulletproof. I've done a lot of uh, traveling in my days and I was in uh, We were able to recover this optimizer and see exactly where, where it failed and why it had failed. Uh, it was pretty obvious anyway. With, uh, with our inverters, we have three phase inverters that work on a 480 volt grid or 208 volt grid. Uh, for 480, we are a four wire Y. If you're doing a, a commercial building, if, or three, if you're choosing to do a 208 commercial building for like residential homes, we can do a four wire Y or three wire Delta. 
But basically for a three-phase technology, uh, we have the longest strings in the industry, which really reduces your balance of system cost. So that's one of the aspects when we're thinking about the solar decathlon is, you know, how much is this going to cost? Um, and I can certainly save you plenty of money on copper and conduit. Uh, it's got a standard 12-year warranty and extendable to 20 or 25 years. For our single-phase inverters, uh, we basically changed how we switch from DC to AC energy. So solar panels make DC energy, and the job of the inverters to turn that into AC energy, right? That's what's used in our homes. So with our inverter, instead of using uh, IGBTs with H-bridges, we basically have a low-voltage um, multi-level distributed switching and I'll, I'll have more slides on that a little bit later and basically we have the most efficient inverter available on the market anywhere it's 99 percent weighted efficiency so that's after you know acceptable losses at low level at high level at at peak efficiency we're 99.5 percent uh, and then we allow you to put a lot more dc energy on it so up to 155 percent dc to ac ratio uh, and the reason for that is solar panels are going to degrade over time and you're going to be able to produce more energy throughout the lifetime of the system with extensive DC to AC ratio. Okay. And then we all monitor those things. Uh, so one thing that's unique about SolarEdge and in my travels, uh, SolarEdge offers you the module level data and all of the monitoring you could ever want for the system for free. Uh, we don't charge you for it. Uh, basically, we view it as a tool to help you. And so we said, you know, what would be great, we could help you, you could help us, we could help each other. And so we have the ability to shoot firmware upgrades to our inverters if they're, if they're uh, connected to the internet. And then you, the installer, would have the ability to make sure that the solar panel is working correctly, that the inverter is working correctly. You're producing an amount of energy. For some of our battery-based inverters or our EV charging inverters, you can control them. You can tell the batteries to start charging maybe discharging because of your uh, rate structure if you're in a time of use window or even you can tell your car to start charging. So the benefits of Solar Edge really come down to four things. We can offer you more energy, a lower operations and maintenance costs, enhanced safety and constraint free design. So we're gonna go through each one of these things um, and just let's get into it. So how do I get you more re revenue? Um, it's through energy and again, I mentioned this before, since we have a module level power electronic and we're doing MPPT on a per solar panel basis, uh, we can extract more energy than a traditional inverter. So because it's a series circuit, there's only one path of current. And if you're using a traditional inverter, if you shade one solar panel, uh, it drops the current for the entire string. But with solar edge, that doesn't happen. You only drop current for that one solar panel, all the other solar solar panels will continue to work. But we don't get shade from just clouds. There's many things that affect a per panel's production. Uh, a good example is tra transport damage. Uh, so these are silicon wafers. The solar cells are made out of silicon. They're 290 nanometers thick. And you know you got that solar panel bouncing around in the back of a truck you might get some micro fractures. It happens during installation all the time. Now with Solar Edge, you'd be able to track the kind of how that solar panel is operating. And maybe if you had a replacement in the inventory, you could pull it out of your inventory and replace that solar panel. If you had that on a string inverter, you would never know. It. But different tilts, different orientation, not all roofs face directly south in the northern hemisphere is the best place to face your solar panels. So sometimes you have east facets or west facets. You can install modules on any facet with Solar Edge. Uh, thermal mismatch, shading, soiling, manufacturing tolerance. So the binning tolerance is what the uh, um, PV module manufacturers or solar panel manufacturers call it. And basically they say we have a 300 watt solar panel. Fantastic, 300 watts is great, but it has a, a rating on it. It's minus zero to plus 5%. So it, it's 300 watts at a minimum. It could be 305 watts. It could be 310 watts. It could be 330 watts. Uh, so wouldn't you like to gather that 
excess energy and you can with solar energy. So the difference here is with bidding tolerance, that's at day one. Now, solar panels degrade over time and they're warranted for that. The technical degradation warranty is 20% over 20 years. But solar panels don't all degrade at the same rate. They degrade at different rates. So again, that, that mismatch, that bending tolerance grows over time. So you have the ability with modular power electronics, you have the ability to capture that excess energy. Uh, roof orientation. So again, this is a good example of a house. Uh, so we have just, albeit a small system, <laughs> eight solar panels uh, facing, we'll, we'll call that uh, we'll call that south. And if you had a traditional inverter, fantastic. But I see more roof space. Maybe the customer has a, a electric hot water heater or, or or maybe they have an EV, so they need more energy to charge that EV. Let's go ahead and put some modules on that east face. And we can totally do that with solar. Edge. So we have no design constraints. Oh, maybe a few, and Gal and I won't go into them. Very limited design constraints is, I guess, what I'll say and uh, a lot more flexibility than traditional string inverters. Uh, balance of system savings. So I keep on talking about strings and be able to put more modules on a series circuit, and that's exactly what this slide is indicating. For our three-phase inverters, uh, we can put up to 60 modules on a single series circuit or string. Uh, so fewer strings means less wiring in combiner boxes less on-site self-crimping and strands. And overall, we see about a 50% reduction in balance of system. So balance of system cost is what we refer to as conduit, electrical wire, conductors, uh, the time to install it. So why that is, is because we can put so many more solar panels on a single string than our competitors. So in this case, we're putting 60 modules. And for the same size system, against a typical competitor, we're gonna be limited to 20 modules. So that's how we can get twice as many modules on a single string and see less uh, cost as related to that. So here's the pen, pencil and paper design. So solar edge system, um, here we have 27.6 kilowatt string inverter. <laughs> uh, in a megawatt scale system, these savings can amount to thousands of dollars. So solar edge, again, three strings per inverter, 44 to 46 modules per string versus our competitor, typically six strings per inverter, 22 to 23 modules per string. And again, that's how we are, we're able to save so much more money. Uh, asset management. So we always want to know how this system is producing and how it's operating. Uh, it uh, shocks me that there's many systems out in the wild that go like unmonitored. No one knows what's happening. It's just sitting on somebody's roof and it could not be working for all they know. Uh, so with Solar Edge, the monitoring portal that we give to you for free, you get module level data. You can pick up fault detection. You can visually see how it's the you know fourth row, tenth module in from the left, and that is the module that may not be working. So you can call Solar Edge tech support, and we can give you free diagnostics and say, oh yeah, looking at the optimizer looks like the optimizer is working just fine, but your input voltage into the optimizer is one third less than what it should be, or all the other neighboring modules. So that's a clear indication that you have a blowing diode inside the module, which is warranted by the panel menu. So that's how we reduce your O&M cost, is basically helping you know what is happening on site before you go there, <laughs> because no one wants to go to a site, do some troubleshooting, call us, figure out what's wrong, go back to their, their home, their warehouse, wherever, and then wait for the new part to come in and then go back. If you save that one truck roll, is what we call that, is a truck roll. If you save that one truck roll, you're gonna save yourself a bunch of money. So fewer trips to site, less time spent on site, et cetera. Safety is always near and dear to my heart. I have always said safety first and safety always. Um, so with safety C, basically you can't turn off the, uh, the put in some verbiage to say that if a first responder or as we can see here, a firefighter comes to the house to put out a fire, they have to have a button to turn off the uh, every single solar panel. So you can't do that with a traditional inverter. You have to use modular power electronics and solar edge meets all the prevailing safety requirements.
So, and we do that again through a trademark term called safety C. So we, we, uh, we call this automatic rapid shutdown. And basically if a first responder comes to the house, usually the first thing they do is they turn off the main circuit breaker or they pull the billing meter to kill all the electrical energy going inside the house. So then it's safe to spray with water. So upon that disconnection, yeah, we uh, immediately drop the rooftop voltage to less than 30 volts within 30 seconds, which is per the requirement. And more conservatively, uh, basically it's safe when wet voltage. So each optimizer is designed to drop to one volt. And there's no added cost for this feature. We just baked it into our product because it was the right thing to do. So here's our product overview and there's so many things to look at on this page. So I'm going to basically do the highlights for a residential inverter. Our HD wave series has got a three kilowatt inverter all the way up to 7.6 kilowatt. And then we have a bigger version of a 10 and 11.4. So those work on a single phase, 240 volt split phase. Uh, for three phase inverters, uh, again, we have 208 volt and 480 volt grid inverters for true three phase. And then we invented a new inverter called the three phase inverter with synergy technology. And basically that's the, uh, the disconnect that you see down here. And all it does is it provides an AC combiner panel, again, reducing the balance of system costs. Uh, on the bottom here, you can see metering and accessories. So we offer devices that monitor the home's energy consumption. So homeowners can make more educated decisions about how they're using their energy. For example, uh, if I'm a homeowner with a consumption meter, that's what I'm measuring, my consumption, I can see that I run my pool pump every night. Fantastic. I'm running my pool pump every night. That's the lowest cost of energy. Uh, however, I'm producing a bunch of solar energy during the day, and I don't get any credit for any energy that I sell back to the grid. So I can make an educated decision and decide to run my pool pump during the day when I have good solar production. Uh, we give you built-in communications using Ethernet or RS-45. So Ethernet will get you to the storage portal. You just got, got to run a Cat5 cable. If you want a wireless option, we do offer those. So Zigbee is basically a radio frequency. You plug one end into the inverter and the other end goes into the homeowner's home office next to the router and they speak wirelessly. Uh, a more compelling product is our cellular cards. So this says GSM plug-in. And basically what the cellular card does is it gathers telemetries and data from the optimizers and the inverter, and then just sends a text message uh, to your ISP, and we can upload all that information to the monitoring portal. So that is truly wireless, and it's easy to install, but it costs a little bit of money. All right. So let's talk a little bit about HD wave technology and how we were able to improve our inverter. So if we think, think about it, inverters are in the tech industry, right? So we're part of the tech industry. And other things that are in the tech industry are computers, <laughs> industry, processing, um, manufacturing, you know, we're, we're all kind of in the tech industry. So, Inverters are basically a big computer and they have not improved over time at the same rate that computers have. I'm sure we can all remember about five years ago, maybe 10 years ago, depending on how old we are, 20 years ago, our first computers. And we were talking about the gigahertz processing speed of that. Maybe if you're old enough like me, <laughs> uh, or maybe if you're a little bit younger, uh, <laughs> paralleling two micro chips or microprocessors together. The improvements that have been made to inverters, uh, I can count on one hand five things. We started off with low frequency isolated inverters, then we went to high frequency isolated inverters, and then we went to uh, transformless inverters, and then we had dual end PVTs, and that was it. That was, that was the industry improvements. Uh, so SolarEdge sought out to change this, and we, we thought about how do we change the inverter? How do, how do we make it better? And so we tried to find some parallels and we found one in the TV industry. So we all remember these old four by three aspect ratio tube TVs. 
uh, this, uh, this little device on the back is called the cathode ray tube. And so the TV industry was suffering from the same thing that we were in the solar industry. They had a limiting device. All TVs were the same size and shape and weight because of the cathode ray tube. And there was definitely a scaling problem with this. You could only make the TV so big because you could only make the glass so big, right? And those things weighed you know, hundreds of pounds. They were super heavy. I don't know if anyone had to move them, but I'm a big, strong guy. So people usually call me to help them move stuff. So I had to move that TV and it just, it sucked. <laughs> so how did we change the TV industry? Well, we added digital electronics. And in the early 2000s, we had flat screen TVs. And by getting rid of the cathode ray tube, now we have these nice, slimmer, lighter TVs, you know, for wall mounting, better resolution, lower cost. I mean, sure, yeah, when plasma and LCD TVs came out on the market 10 years ago, 20 years ago, yeah, they were expensive. But now, man, I can, I can go over to Costco and pick up a 45-inch Toshiba for 300 bucks. I mean, they're, they're very low cost now. So what did solar the industry did? So we focused on three things. We focused on our cooling components, our electronics, and our magnetics. Um, and long story short, we had to reinvent the way an inverter takes DC energy, which is a solid state energy, to make it AC energy, which is a sine wave form, right? So we, we had to figure out how to do this. Uh, so what we were able to do is we, by focusing on our cooling components, uh, we knew we had to improve our efficiency so we could reduce the size of cooling components by increasing our efficiency. Uh, to increase our efficiency, we had to, and to reduce heat, we had to reduce the, the magnetics and then improve the electronics. All right, so from our standard inverter, uh, so if you look at this slide here, a previous six kilowatt inverter was about 55 pounds, 97.5% efficient. Same inverter with HD wave technology. So we, I'll go through each step and what each thing does. We were able to reduce the size by half, increase the efficiency by one and a half percent, and then reduce the weight by half, a little more than half. So I know a lot of people maybe on, on the line might be thinking, man, one and a half percent efficiency, that's good. But when you look at it as a manufacturer, our deficiencies were two and a half percent, and we reduced our deficiencies by one and a half percent. That was our last product. That is incredible and mind blowing. So that's why I'm really excited about this technology. All right. So how did we change our magnetics? Well, we, because we have a more efficient inverter with our DSP processor and our more sinusoidal waveform, uh, we were able to reduce the magnetic size by 16 times less which then produces less heat. All that switching produces less heat. So we need you know, smaller cooling elements. Our heat sink is much smaller, two and a half times smaller. So how do we do it? So basically, if you look at this image on the right-hand side here, you see these four gray rectangles. So those are called IGBTs, and it stands for Insulated Gate Bipolar Transistor. And the name's not important, but what it is is what it does. And basically, it's just a silicon switch. All it does is switch DC voltage to create this square waveform, okay? Then the magnetics, the copper winding here, filters that square waveform to a more sinusoidal or a sinus wave. That is AC energy. That's what we need, right? By adding a lot more switches, we were able to switch up and down a little bit, up and down a little bit on this image on the left, and we were able to create and start with a more sinusoidal waveform. Therefore, we needed less magnetics and less cooling. And we we're able to do this through a powerful DSP processor. Basically, all electronics engineers should be looking at this and say, yeah, of course, the easy solution is add more switches. And so that's what we did. The hard part was programming those switches to switch in the right order and frequency. And that's where the breakthrough was. So now, again, we need less magnetics, less filtering. It's more cost effective less heat, it's just a better product. That's why I'm so super excited. Oh, and I think we won an award for it. The uh, 2016, when we unveiled this technology, we won Innovative Technology of the Year Award from uh, InterSolar. 
to improve upon this innovation, we wanted to bake in more features into the inverter. So AAA did a study about uh, two years ago, maybe last year, about uh, the US and how many drivers are looking at EVs. And they said that 30% of drivers driving today in the US are thinking within the next five years, they're gonna have an EV. So one in three of us are already thinking about our next electric vehicle or our next vehicle is gonna be an EV. And then they, AAA, improved upon the study and they said, okay, well, if one in three people are looking for their next vehicle to be an EV, you know, why is that? And the top three responses were, uh, it's better for the environment, innovative technology, and, oh man, I can't remember the third one off the top of my head, but anyway, those responses align very well with the solar industry. So I'd, I don't have a report that says how many or, or people that have solar systems on their house, how many of them are looking for EVs, but I bet you the percentage is, is a lot higher. So what SolarEdge decided to do is we integrated a EV charger or EV charging capabilities into our inverter. So it's a level two EVSE, which stands for electric vehicle supply equipment, which means it can charge your car at 40 amps. So the biggest uh, pushback that most people have about uh, getting an EV or the reason they don't want to get an EV is because they have no place to charge it. Well, now you do. You're already getting the solar system. Just throw the EV on there. Now you can charge your car from sun, from sunlight, clean, renewable sunlight. It's awesome. Um, so typical EV efficiencies, you know, 30 kilowatt hours to 100 miles. Uh, typical PV resource, we get five kilowatt hours per meter squared of sunlight per day. So sure, we can charge this car from sunlight. Also storage, you know, energy independence is a, is a big topic. And a lot of people are thinking about, well, what if the grid goes down? And uh, what if I have a refrigerator full of meat? Or what if there's a storm? Am I gonna be able to power my home? So SolarEdge partnered with LG Chem and we have a couple of battery packs from LG Chem. The Resu 10H, which is a high voltage battery pack, so 400 volts, um, that connect directly to our store edge inverter. So we call this store edge because it's awesome and that's a great name, of course, we trademarked it. And what storage can do is we can take solar energy directly from the sun and charge it, charge the battery. So we call that DC coupling and I think I have another slide on it in a minute. We can also back up some selected loads. So if you want, if the grid goes down and you need some energy independence, we tell our installers to target high dollar value add items first, like a refrigerator, like um, maybe some convenience outlets, a garage door. You want to be able to open your garage if the power is out, right? Uh, but the bigger loads, the non-essential loads, like uh, your air conditioner, your washer, your dryer, your furnace, those are non-essential loads, and we are going to leave those connected to the grid, and they will stay off and we can monitor how energy comes and goes from the house. Now in California, all of our utilities have put us onto time of use rates, which means we pay more for energy during certain times of the day. So a lot of people are choosing to use this battery to offset those expensive kilowatt hours. Because as you can guess, those expensive kilowatt hours are typically uh, occur when there's no or not a lot of usable sunlight. So like from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. So a lot of people, we call that time of use arbitrage and that's how they use the battery to help offset the cost of batteries. So more energy, how do we get more energy out of an energy storage system? And again, it's through DC coupling. So we can go straight from the PV array to the battery pack, DC to DC, and charge the battery pack at the highest efficiency possible and then when we want to use that energy, we only have one D efficiency, which is the DC to AC conversion. This is compared to traditional AC coupled storage systems. So AC coupling just means you have multiple AC devices. So in this example, we have a solar array with a solar inverter, and then you have a battery with a battery inverter. And if you think about how you want to use that energy, you want to store that energy from the solar array, right? So if we just follow this line here, we say, okay, solar through the inverter goes from DC to AC, 
and then we have to go AC back to DC. And every time you do that, you lose energy, you lose efficiency. And then when you want to use that energy, you got to go DC back to AC. So you have three inversion losses. So that's how Solar Edge gets you more energy uh, with batteries because we're DC coupled. All right, so let's go through uh, concepts of operations and how the optimizers are so great and how they do what they do to help mitigate uh, shade and help increase our energy. So here we go. We have a solar edge system right here. We've got 10 optimizers wired in series. Uh, they're in safety mode because we don't have the system on and they're exporting one volt per optimizer. So another benefit of this safety voltage or the safety C is now when a installer installs the system and they want that feedback of, did I connect everything correctly? They can test the DC voltage and say, oh, I have 10 solar panels and I measured 10 volts. Yep, everything looks good. Okay, when the inverter goes into production mode, the inverter works on a fixed voltage principle. All right, fixed voltage. So with HD wave single phase inverters that are less, six kilowatts and less, uh, that fixed voltage is 380 volts. So no matter how sunny it is, no matter how cold it is, we will always see 380 volts around there at the inverter. So the job of the optimizer is to buck or boost the voltage coming from the solar panel to make sure the inverter always sees 380. So we're gonna apply a little Watts law. And if we remember anything from Watts law, it's power equals to current times voltage. So we have 280 watt panels times 10. So that means our power is 2,800 watts, all right? So if I wanted to find the amount of current of my DC string, mathematically, of course, I could take my power, power is equal to, again, uh, volts times amps, so I divide volts by three sides, or excuse me, by both sides, and I take 2,800, divide by 380, and I find 7.4 amps. So now I know that my string, my series circuit is 7.4 amps. If I wanted to see what the voltage of the optimizer was, and again, I want to do this mathematically and not check our awesome monitoring portal, I could say, okay, well, each solar panel is at 280 watts, and I know each solar panel or the DC string is at 7.4 amps. So I divide 280 by 7.4 and I get 38. And the reverse way of figuring this out is I know I have a series circuit. Therefore, in a series circuit, your voltage is additive, and I have 10 solar panels and 10 optimizers in my series circuit. So 38 times 10 is 380. Weird how that works out. Now, the crux of the situation is, well, what happens when we shade a solar panel? When, when a solar panel stops producing as much energy, what do we expect to happen? And when we lose sunlight, or we have shade, when we lose sunlight, we lose a radiance, therefore we lose current, current will drop. So let's shade a solar panel and see what that looks like. There we go. So we shaded this panel, panel number two, and it's a dark gray cloud that covers just one solar panel. That Those exist all the time. <laughs> anyway, this solar panel is now producing at half. So it's 140 watts versus its neighbors at 280 watts. So what do you think happened? We lost power, so we lost 140 watts. So our new system power is 2,660 watts. My fixed voltage stays the same. It's constant, it does not change, right? So if I do the math again, and I see 2,660 divided by 380, I get seven amps. Now, if I go back a slide, I'm gonna go back a slide, the amperage was 7.4 without shade. So just like we expected to happen, we lost sunlight, we lose current. And that's exactly what happened here. We lost sunlight, so we lost current. So now our current is seven amps. But if we do the math again on our optimizer voltage, we'll take 280 divided by seven is 40 volts. And if we see the optimizer up here, that's at half the amount of power. So 140 watts divided by seven amps is only 20 volts. So we see that these optimizers that are unshaded will boost their voltage while the shaded optimizer will produce as much as it can. And this happens dynamically, 12 times a second to be exact. 
And if we were to do our math again, and we add up all of our voltages, we'd see nine times 40 is, you know, is a 200 and, excuse me, 360 plus 20 is 380. Even if a module goes completely down, if a module just does not operate anymore, we will still produce more energy. So if our string inverter counterparts, if this happened to them, this module will go and bypass and all the other, excuse me, all the other modules on the, on the string would derate to the lowest common denominator. So whatever is being shaded the most is how they would operate. Uh, the same principle passes through on our commercial inverters, our three-phase inverters. Uh, the only caveat being is that we have two modules per one optimizer, and that was to help reduce the amount of cost. So now we have two modules per one optimizer. So instead of a, you know, 250 watt module, think of it as a 500 watt super module. And all the same principles apply with the exception of the voltage. So the voltage is 840 volts, 850, usually around 850. And you can apply Watt's law again and do the math. 10,000 divided by 840 is 11.9 amps. And again, our optimizers are at 42 volts. And again, if you even if you shade this module or those pairs of modules, we will still compensate by passing that excess power through as voltage, even though we're losing current. Even if the modules are completely dead, we still do it. Okay, so that's how Solar Edge works. And if you understand those fundamental principles, you are <laughs> you are ahead of most. All right, so let's get into system design. And I'm gonna run us through kind of the pencil and paper way of designing a PV system. And if I were using a legacy inverter, I would have to consider all of these things. I would have to determine my DC string length and calculate my, my record high voltage, would, which would be related to my record low weather. Uh, because we know that heat is a big resistor and as things heat up, our voltage will drop. So conversely, when things cool off, our voltage increases and I don't want to overvolt my inverter. I have to group modules and strings and design my layout. And there's a lot of constraints here that you can feel free to read. You have to do anything that with Solar Edge. So let's get into Solar Edge design rules. So our design rules can be found on the bottom of our spec sheet. And basically, we had an online designer that Gil will run us through. It makes this so much easier. But all you have to consider is the amount of power you can put on a single string. So all you need is a basic, the most basic calculator. Um, and then again, note that in some cases, two modules to one optimizer supported. Uh, and we see these maximum power per string on the bottom of this texture right here. So single phase, 700 watts, uh, 50 watts. The one check that you do have to do is to make sure that the module will not overvolt or overamp the optimizer. That's that's the hardest check. And again, you need a basic calculator for this. So on step one, voltage, your VOC, and it says at STC, which is a thousand watts per meter squared and 25 degrees Celsius, this module will have 38.1 volts when not under load. Cool. And then you look at the thermal data, negative 0.33% per degree C. So what this means is the voltage will change a third of a percent for every difference that your installation site temperature is, your record low, five degrees. So let's do some math. math. So I looked up the uh, record low in San Francisco. So I'm, I'm close to the Bay Area. Thought San Francisco was, uh, was a good cause. And the record low for San Francisco is negative five degrees Celsius. Okay. So if I wanted to find the differences in temperature, I take my record low and subtract it from my standard test condition. 
So negative five minus 25 is negative 30 degrees. I can take my temperature coefficient of voltage and I can say, okay, negative 30 times negative 0.33% per degree C yields 9.9. .9. So roughly 10%. The voltage will change 10% if I install. So I take my VOC, my 38.1 volts, and I add 10% of the voltage to that, which is 41.87 volts. And I look at this, all right? So at record low temperature, 41.87. And I look at my power optimizers. Oh no, I have a, I have a typo. This should say P300 and not P3000, but it's a 300 watt optimizer. The maximum input voltage is 48 volts which is higher than this record low temperature voltage, right? So that works, it's compliant. Um, so this is the hard way to do it. Again, math and paper. And again, we'll go into our, our designer and you'll see Gal just, we recommend which optimizers to use based on your location. So a lot of people ask me, there's different module architecture types out there and I wanna use different solar panels. You know, what if I have some old solar panels that I want to want to reuse? Can I use them? And can I combine two modules to one optimizer? Absolutely. You still got to check. So this is an example where we have two modules in series to one optimizer. And so the P405 has much higher DC voltage. And when we do the calculation for cold weather, we find here that the cold weather voltage is gonna be 34.4 volts, but because they're in series, I gotta double it, which makes it 68.8 volts. And again, voltage adds in series. Now, if I'd wired those two solar panels in parallel, that would have kept the voltage constant and would have increased the current. So if I had wired these in parallel, this would not be a compliant design. So you can do that. You can wire two modules in series. But there are some modules out there that allow you to wire in parallel. Uh, and a good example would be thin film modules. So in this example, again, we're using the P405. Look at the current. The ISD rating is 2.2 amps. So if we were to do our cold weather check, our cold weather check says, yep, we're good for one solar panel in series, not two, but I can do two solar panels in parallel. And again, you can see the, the voltage staying constant and the current being additive in a parallel circuit. Great. Okay, we're getting to the nitty gritty and uh, Gal is about to take over for the designer. So uh, I'm gonna run through just a little bit about the designer, kind of what Gal's gonna take over to the demo. All right, so with our system designer, basically we wanted to make a interactive web-based tool that helps you validate your solar edge system design from inception to installation. So we wanted you to have a designer sit in the office, a salesperson, go to somebody's house and take a satellite image and say, this is what your house will look like with solar on it. And this is how much energy you're gonna produce with said solar system. This is the equipment we're going to install. And then after the sale is closed, the installers go out and install the system that was designed and agreed upon. And then after they're done with that, the uh, sales guy can come back and do the ex inspection and make sure everything's done correctly. So we wanted this kind of workflow from start to finish to be streamlined. Uh, and we again, we're offering this to people for free. So I, <laughs> I really don't understand why no one would not want to use this, everybody should want to use this. I use the double negative there, I totally get it. All right, so let's look at our satellite image. So we, again, we're powered by Google. So we can draw the outline of the roof, uh, make a 3D image of it, put some solar panels on it, and then show that customer what the roof might look like. Um, we can validate the electrical design. So there's there's no, math and paper calculation of will this work is this allowed it's all automatically done with dynamic feedback uh, so you don't have to figure out what the record low weather is you don't have to do any of that it's all done for you uh, multiple users can access every project super easy to do 
Uh, once the design is complete, you can upload that design to the monitoring portal and uh, the homeowner can view that information through their computer or through one of our smartphone applications. Uh, the installers can map the location of each solar panel using the camera of their phone just by scanning the QR codes. And then uh, we're gonna, we have a walkthrough tutorial and video on, on how to use the designer. Uh, so if you follow this link up here, you can get to the designer or you can just go to solarenge.com, click the login button and then drop down to designer. And I think Gal is gonna run us through how to use the designer. Gal, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Thank you very much, Cameron. I'll just wait to get the uh, screen presentation rights. And yeah. I'm, so, I'm so glad I can stop talking now. <laughs> <laughs> so just let me know, like, final sentence, can you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. You look great. Okay, great. Okay, so thanks. Um, what I'm going to do today is uh, run a demo of designing a residential system um, for maximizing the owner's self-consumption. So to do that, I'll first access uh, the designer. So as Cameron just mentioned, we, you can uh, do it, uh, of course, from the SolarEdge website. Um, once you, uh, of course, you need uh, to have a SolarEdge account, but this is uh, a free registration, really easy uh, process. You get an activation link to your account to get immediate access to our e-learning portal and to the designer. Once you do that, you're good to go. Uh, you log in, and the first page you will see will be the list of projects, the list of designs. Of course, now I have no existing projects, and I click this plus button to start my new design, giving it a name. And then I'll need to uh, type an address. So I picked an address in California. And I was, um, I figured that since I think we're going to uh, create a design challenge, uh, of maybe uh, some structure. We uh, went for an empty plot, as you can see here from the, um, from the Google uh, satellite image. Um, and I'll create a design using um, a roof plan. So before I do that, just to discuss a bit, the, um, um, what we get from Google is not only the image, uh, we actually need uh, in order to give um, the right, of course, the right products and uh, an accurate energy um, estimation, we need location data um, So for our calculations. So we need the latitude, the longitude, uh, the altitude, and the time zone. Uh, and all that we get um, from this uh, Google address uh, search. Uh, and from, from the location, we infer several things. So first of all, we infer we uh, get the closest weather station. So we have a database of weather stations that we purchased from Meteonorm. And uh, those are, uh, for each weather station, has a, um, what is called a typical meteorological year uh, that contains monthly uh, values. Like, like for each month, uh, we're getting a set of uh, weather uh, attributes. So we're getting, uh, for every month, the values of the uh, global horizontal irradiance, um, also called the GHI values. Uh, we get the values of diffused horizontal irradiance, the DHI, and we also get the ambient temperature values uh, per month. And we will need that in, uh, in, uh, in our algorithms, in our calculations um, um, uh, for energy. Uh, also, we get uh, from the location data, we infer the, all of the available grids and the most common electricity grid voltage in the area. So this is because we designed for grid-tied systems. Um, and any additional uh, regulatory, like location-specific requirement, uh, for example, like uh, export limitation or anything that is uh, more country-specific. Next thing I will do, since I would like to create a design to maximize uh, the self-consumption, I'll enter an annual uh, consumption in kilowatt hours. So 
I can either take like a month of, of um, um, uh, energy usage and kind of get an average, or I'll just have this uh, figure up front. So that's the annual consumption. And then I'll select a typical load profile. So the typical load profile is actually kind of an energy behavioral pattern uh, based on the type of household. So for example, uh, for retirees or working from home, you can see a 24 hours uh, span and you can see that most electricity uh, will take place uh, a day. So this is the, uh, the usage, um, the consumption. If I go to family with school age children, you'll see it a bit differently. And I will actually pick the single or two person household, which is kind of a double peak um, um, uh, profile uh, where the occupants usually don't, uh, are not in the house, uh, or let's say they're at work uh, during noon times, which is actually when the PV is producing the most. Then, of course, I can see the uh, uh, electricity grid for the uh, split face. Uh, I don't have any export limitations, so I can go ahead and click on Create. And we have here to the left, we have a kind of a navigation bar which streamline, uh, streamlines our design uh, process of project info. And then I'm, I'm moving to Site Modeling to create a site model uh, of the house. Now, uh, what I'll do since I'm going to use a roof plan, I need to upload it and then scale it, uh, um, scale it on the Google uh, satellite image. So we'll, so we, so first we have a draw tool here, and I'll just click a point, and I want to create a seventy-seven uh, feet edge. So. Once I have it, I can go ahead and click and selecting a roof plan. We have kind of a cool initial adjustment wizard that helps us by just placing uh, two pins at the same place. Uh, um, kind of an immediate um, adjustment the scale um, of the picture. And this is really great when you're, when you have, for example, a drone image or a very high resolution image that you would like to upload and kind of replace it and put it, place it on top of the Google image of an existing house since it's a roof plan and I step, and then I can just manually scale my image so I can kind of use the re, uh, resize, um, rotate, and move it until I get to the 77 um, feet line here, or seven pixel per meter. So I can kind of just put it here and see that it fits. Once I'm happy with it, I'll just click on apply. And now I can just design, uh, continue or actually start my design on top of this uh, roof, uh, draw tool. I can, of course, zoom in, pan uh, my, in the canvas. And then again, clicking points to create, uh, uh, to outline the roof. I'll start the roof parameter. See that I add a lot of, kind of snappy uh, edges are parallel, um, or whenever I have 90 degree angle. So I'll just go ahead and till I have this closing edge snapping. So I outline the parameter of the roof. Now I can kind of double pushes. Quickly do that. Okay, great. Now using uh, an obstacles tool, I'll mark any obstacles that I've also, I have on my roof. So I have something that looks like a chimney, uh, the AC panel, panel, and another chimney. So I'll just mark my, my obstacles. 
Now, it's, I'm actually going to switch from a 2D view to a 3D view. Once I click it, and I'm in a 3D world, and I got a house which is one story high by default, and it's flat, so I want to give it some tilt. So to do that, I can, uh, you see, when I click on one of the roof facets, I can see that it's in zero. The ridge line in rays, I can just drag up to uh, create the house 3D model. Also, if I know any uh, measurements, or for example, I know it's a 412 uh, roof pitch, so I, and the roof will just adjust. Uh, I can also, uh, of course, set the height of my obstacles. I have here a chimney, so it's a bit high. Let's say it's two. Eight. And in case of clicking, I can also flush it, make it like flush, uh, so it won't cast any any shade. So once I'm done with creating kind of a model of, of, the, of the site, go ahead uh, to place my solar panel on it. Uh, we have a cool feature called an irradiance uh, map where we calculate um, uh, using the sun position and the site model. So for every hour in the year, uh, using the three radiance components of the uh, weather radiance, uh, we can calculate the solar axis values, also known as um, TSFR, uh, total solar resource fraction. So uh, on, on, all of, on all of the roof facets, and uh, so you see when uh, the more uh, yellow bright ones are the ones that are getting most sun. And uh, if I'll take the north face facing, so we're in the northern hemisphere, uh, the north face facet will get only 75% uh, azimuth and tilt in this location. Also, if I go over next to some obstacles, you can see how as close I get to an obstacle, it will be more shaded and I'll uh, drop the um, sun axis values. So we're taking actually to, uh, into account the tilt and orientation uh, of the faucets, as well as any shade from uh, near shading objects. Uh, we can also, of course, add obstacles or nearby building uh, also not on the roof, off the roof, uh, or from um, chimneys or uh, vents or any obstacles that we've placed on the roof. <clears throat> so I'll pick this facet. I'll, so I'm now in kind of a facet mode. Uh, and now, before I place any uh, modules, uh, I want to show also the option to... So, we know that in some um, jurisdictions, there's fire code setbacks, or you have kind of pathway requirements, or wind load requirements, where you need to keep some distance from uh, the roof edges. So, using kind of a guideline tool, or actually by... <clears throat> sorry, by hovering over an edge and pulling it inward, I can create, for example, a three feet setback from this side and three feet from this side, which will help me in the um, uh, placement of the modules. That tool, I just click it and select the module, the solar panel I'm going to use for this design. I'll go for an LG. Uh, 320 uh, watt panel. They will be flush mounted. It means that I sit with no additional tilt or azimuth <coughs> in portrait orientation and no spacing. To place the module, I'll just click on any point on the roof and drag to add uh, the module. So, so extend it and you can see we have here um, uh, system uh, gauges sorry system uh, gauges at the bottom which shows me how much modules i've placed so let's say here for example i'll place 60 modules then i can click this entire site 
button just to exit the facet mode and I'll pick this facet now. Just click the add PV modules tool and I'm using the same module type so I don't need to, and to select it again. And I'll add, um, let's say, nine modules here. So I have 25 PV modules, eight kilowatt peak. Um, sorry. Uh, and I'm ready to create my first uh, electrical design. I'll click the electrical design tab and I'll see, uh, I'll get a recommendation. This is the design recommendation based, of course, on the location and the DC and the uh, DCAC uh, oversizing ratio. So <clears throat> the system already gives me the recommended, the most cost effective inverter and the compatible power optimizer that is compatible with the solar panel that I chose and with the inverter. So I don't need to, I don't have to do any of those calculations using pen and pencil anymore. I'll click on create and I'll see the inverter is now here, in this kind of uh, inverter box. And now using a string tool, I'll create uh, the strings, connect the modules actually with power up, click on one uh, empty module and drag. And you can see here also at the bottom here using the system gauges, we already display all of the solar, all of the design rules already here uh, in this little chip. So for example, I know that uh, for this uh, single phase, uh, inverter, I can connect uh, between 8 to 25 uh, optimi uh, modules, sorry, and up to um, uh, 6 um, kilowatt of string uh, power. So as long as the string is too short, it, it's uh, red. When it's in the valid uh, range, it will turn green. So I'll, I'll string one string with 16 optimizers, then I'll do, so you see we, I have two strings and uh, at different lengths. Now I'm ready to go to the summary and report. And this is where we uh, run a simulation. So we run again the uh, year round hour uh, based on all of the uh, data that we've inputted and the weather data. And then we, you can see here in the report, we have the installed power, the max achieved DC power based on how you position the modules and the location, of course, of the design, uh, the DC AC oversizing, the active AC power, and the annual energy um, simulation uh, result. Then we also have in the estimated monthly energy and monthly breakdown of the simulation. Um, and you can see since the tip, the load profile I chose uh, at home during most of the PV production hours, the self-consumed energy is quite low and most of the energy is kind of exported uh, to the grid. Then also I can see in the report, in the summary report, the system production can total production. This is for the estimated production. How much I was able to actually consume by myself, which is uh, pretty low, uh, and how much I exported, which is 71%. Uh, and based, from the, uh, based on the consumption that I uh, inputted, I was able to actually uh, consume uh, from the PV, only 35%, and I had to import the rest, which is 65% uh, from the grid. Then we also provide the comprehensive uh, system loss diagram, a summary of modules, bill of material, and electrical design. Now I would like to actually uh, um, create uh, a better design to increase the self-consumption rate. So what I will do is I'll go back to electrical design. I can go back and forth and edit and play what if scenarios. Uh, so I don't need to recreate uh, every time uh, design for any, um, any change. But what I will do now, I'll select the inverter. I will delete it. And I'll, get, uh, I'll ask for a different recommendation. This time I will select add storage and I'll select some storage capacity. So I'll use the LG Cam 
uh, RSU10 uh, uh, battery using our storage inverter, uh, again, with the same power optimizer. So I'll click on generate. You can see this uh, little nice uh, battery icon next to the inverter. I'll create actually the same uh, string design, 16, another one of nine. Go again to the summary and reports. And you can already see that I increased the self-consumption. I only need to import uh, 42%. I can even go and, and increase it further uh, by adding a second battery. So this is um, uh, another feature that storage supports, adding um, um, additional storage capacity. So only one battery operates uh, at any given time. Um, because they are connected also in parallel connection to the inverter. So to do that, I can click on the inverter, use the edit tool here, and increase to two batteries connected to this inverter. This is actually the maximum that, are, that I can connect right now. And now I'm at 77% of self-consumption only 23% um, uh, percent needed, needs to be imported. So I, I managed to kind of offset my energy, 77% um, uh, uh, I can actually use my energy, the energy of the PV system. Um, the last thing of course, uh, can, uh, that is we have since we are uh, solar edge, um, this is the design tool of SolarEdge, also the option to export. So this is once uh, the installer actually uh, gets, gets the deal and the system is installed, it can export it and kind of uh, seamlessly and immediately create the same uh, layout onto our monitoring platform. So with that, uh, this was the short demo of designing uh, the system for uh, maximizing self-consumption. Great, so, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yep. Yes, thank you so much. Um, Rachel, are you, um, I just wanted to make sure that you um, wanted to see, provide a few comments before we started our um, question and answer session, so feel free if you haven't submitted a question um, to do so anytime in the next few minutes. Great. Thank you, Lynn. Okay. Um, before we conclude, a few reminders. Uh, don't forget to be using the hashtag solar decathlon design. We've had some great posts that we love to see the work you're doing and the designs, and also solar decathlon has been posting as we look forward to Design Challenge Weekend coming up here soon. We want to thank our host sponsors, Ingersoll Rand and Solar Edge. Thank you to both our speakers today for a wonderful webinar. We also have a lot of education sponsors who are helping to make this event possible, uh, and we thank them for their contributions to the event. So make sure you join us for the next webinar. Uh, we will be talking about organizing the project report. That webinar is on March 6th at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and you can register today for that. Again, this webinar, as with all other webinars, will be recorded and available on the groups.io project site for your reference as you work on your project. So with that, we'd be happy to take questions. Great, thank you so much. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Cameron, and thanks, um, Gal, for all that great information. Um, the first few questions that we have, I think, Rachel, um, you can speak to these. Um, with Solar Edge as a sponsor, are the teams required to use Solar Edge pro products? The teams are not required to use Solar Edge pod products, but uh, Solar Edge has presented some great information here that you uh, will definitely find valuable as you work on your project. 
Great, thanks, Rachel. And the next one, um, are there, with Solar Edge as a sponsor, are there any limitations or restrictions with them being an industry partner for any of the teams? Uh, so Solar Edge could be your industry partner. You're welcome to reach out to them to provide you with additional assistance if that's helpful. They've provided a lot of resources to help teams get started today. Um, and they have uh, provided additional information that will be available on the groups.io project site as well. Great, thank you. Um, the next couple questions are for Cameron and Gal. Um, I believe that both of you mentioned, so the design tool that um, was demoed, it is at, um, available to the students at no cost, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So and they can they can register for through. Uh, I think we gave you a link that might be listed in the resources, uh, so they can register that way, or they can just go to SolarEdge.com and uh, register through our website. Great, thank you, Cameron. Um, are there any limits then to how many team members can access and use the tool then? Uh, nope, there is no limitation. <clears throat> Actually, um, there is also an option. Uh, they can create an account and they can add multiple users to the same account. So if they're like te a team, they can all collaborate, use one kind of account per team and add users. The first one that creates the account is will be the account admin. And then using the uh, users management, uh, he can kind of add users, just uh, add their emails, and they will be added to his account. There is no and limitation. Great. Yeah, sorry. That, is, that, that actually does um, follow on the, uh, you, uh, the next question is that um, how, if team members can work on the same project. So um, Gal, could you repeat that? How would a team with multiple team members, how would they work on that same project? So is it um, can you walk through the basic steps again? Sure. So, so what they will uh, need to do is first to uh, go to the uh, to the designer or to the Solar Edge website and create their first uh, installer account. It's, it's we call it installer account. They provide uh, an email uh, and they and uh, they'll get an activation uh, link sent to this email. They'll set up their password. And the first one that is doing it in the name of the team, uh, he will become the um, account admin for this team. Then he has a console, a console once he, he logs in. Um, maybe I can share maybe the, the link to it. Um, and from there, he has user management. And he can add more additional like peers or people from the same team. OK, so I'll share my screen again. So here, I don't know if you, if you missed it, do I have user management? This will be uh, only visible to the account admin. And then here, for, for example, uh, this is the monitoring platform. This is currently we handle all of the account uh, management from uh, the monitoring. So here I have user, uh, user management or users, and I can add a new user by just adding his email. Uh, you can just leave the role uh, as is. It doesn't matter. It will all map to a solar edge, uh, to a designer account uh, member. So this is how you will do it. And then uh, coming back here, so the account admin will see a list of um, the users. You will see a, a list of all the users in the same group. Now, when once you log into the designer, each one will have we can, uh, can log in with his own. Uh, email email address and create his own designs, but they can also collaborate. They will be able to see each other's designs. Uh, if I'll go here to the back to the site list, I have here also we have a filter, so I can either filter to see only my projects or if I would have additional uh, team members uh, here. So uh, I can also filter out and view only my projects. 
Great. And could you also clarify, Gal, is there, uh, once they have added team members, um, this account admin, is there a limit to how many team members can be added to one project? I, um, I'll have to verify, but I believe there is no limit. Great. Thank you so much. I, um, I, I don't think there is any limit. I think it can be, uh, it's an unlimited number. Okay, great. Thank you. Or at you. least it's a very big one. <laughs> okay. Um, the last question um, for the Solar Edge team is about the how long will the project stay um, on the website? Because some of these projects will actually be multiple months. So, is there any time limitation of when a project um, will no longer be available, or is that window open? Well, I, I guess you're talking about the designer, the online design tool. Yes. And they will be available. There is no time limit, no time frame. So once a team creates a project and shares that they could have and work on that project for um, many months. For months, and it will yeah. yes, 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 definitely. Okay, great. Um, that does wrap up all the questions that we've gotten during our live session. I just want to send a reminder that um, because um, these webinars are being recorded on, and posted for the teams on the group site, um, feel free to send questions um, after today um, to the email addresses that you see on the screen. Um, with that, I just want to make sure to thank our speakers again, Rachel, Cameron, Gal, you Thanks for um, providing such great information. And I wanted to give the speakers um, a few moments to do any closing remarks if they'd like. Uh, yeah, I'll say so, something. Uh, so yeah. Again, this is Cameron. Thank you so much for having us on here. Uh, good luck. We hope that you uh, use our tools like our, like our product and helps guide you through your solar decathlon design. Feel free to reach out. If you have any questions, we're always happy to help. Exactly. Great. Thank you, teams. Good luck. And we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week. Thank you.